HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Today's program is brought to you by greatbrewers.com, a social media marketing platform dedicated to promoting the world's great brewers and the beers they create. For more information, visit greatbrewers.com. I'm Laura Stanley, host of Inside School Food. You are listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Good evening and welcome to Fun Men About, About it. it on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. I'm Mary Isaac. And I'm Chris Kuzmi. And we're your co-hosts of this weekly journey of all things fermented. Archived on iTunes, Stitcher, and right here on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. All right, let's go ahead with the announcements. So first up is Kuzmi and I are doing a Valentine's Day Beer, cheese, and chocolate pairing at Jimmy's number 43 this Saturday on actual Valentine's Day. What time does it start, Tuesday? That starts at 8 o'clock p.m. You can find more information about that on Jimmy's NO43.com. I'll also be playing saxophone with a piano player uh, to be determined who the piano player is, but probably Gabriel Jordowski, who is pretty awesome, and we have a lot of fun playing together. And uh, I'm going to play some sweet sweet melodious etudes to go Absolutely. with your beer chocolate and cheese and this is not just for 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 pairs <laughs> for couples this is for open to everybody we're just going to be celebrating cheese chocolate beer and a little bit of jazz there'll be four pairings of beer chocolate and cheese followed by uh a uh, chocolate and spirit pairing because jimmy's just got his license to uh to serve spirits so we'll, all new york state spirits that's right so we're going to close out with that be fun also coming up uh at the end of the month is new york city beer week there's a lot of stuff going on with that um the the events are are numerous uh but the main ones are the opening tap on friday february 20th at bars around new york city each bar is going to feature a different rare or unique keg and tap it at seven o'clock uh, the idea there it will be listed at nycbg.com uh, what beers are being tapped so that you can kind of plan your own pub crawl and go visit places you haven't seen based on the beers that they have to offer. Uh, opening Bash is on Saturday the 21st, and uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be at the Altman Building from 1 to 4 p.m. Also, That's more, in Chelsea, by the way. That's in Chelsea, right in Manhattan. And then on February 22nd, uh, this is not an official New York City Beer Week event, but it is officially awesome. It's Brunity at the Bell House. Brunity is the collective of, of homebrew clubs and homebrew stores. It's going to be from 1 to 5 p.m. Uh, at the Bell House. Uh, find out more information about that at brunity.com, B-R-E-W-N-I-T-Y. There's going to be some com. killer lineup of homebrews there. 50 plus, and I've been talking to, we're going to have a band of brusicians, actually, so so we're going to have a set of uh, of some wonky tunes, of what, and I think I might rewrite the lyrics to Can't Touch This, dedicated to all the all the beer drinkers out there, mm. Can't Drink This, you know, in honor of beer, BJCP judging. And stuff. I, I thought you were going to talk about Can't Touch This in Sanitation or something. Oh, yeah, could be that, yeah, <laughs> that works too. That'll be a verse, we'll work it out. Anyway, I'm going to get my rap on, we'll figure, we'll figure that out. <laughs> And on Tuesday is Brewer's Choice. That's right. And that's going to be on Wave, at Waverly next to Kelsey. Kelso, what's the address of, of Kelso? Uh, or, 529. 529. That voice, you've heard it before. Episode 29. It's 
awesome voice, very experienced guy. We'll talk about him in a second. But Brewer, what is Brewer's Choice? Brewer's Choice is a celebration of food and beer. Yep. And one of the cool things about it <laughs> is that there's a smash. We've done a, it's gonna This year, it's, gonna, it's in conjunction with uh, the uh, Brewer's Association. We're talking about uh, pumping up New York State uh, agriculture, local grains, and how it works within the brewing, brewing community. So a lot of the requirement for every brewer that's participating in this, they had to make a beer using um, at least 30% of New York State grains. Uh, and to that note, also with the Brewers Guild, we all made a smash beer. Smash being, in this case, state malt and state hops. And this leads me to the next announcement that Mary and I have started our own <clears throat> beer architect company, <laughs> for lack of better terms. We're basically, we're basically gypsy brewing. So uh, we have brewed our first beer at Greenpoint, home Greenpoint. of Kelso and Heartland beers, and a lot of other great beers come out of that. So we brewed 15 barrels of a Cousette Grisette, a session-style farmhouse ale made with New York State malts and hops. And Chris tasted it today. He, it's he, tasting lovely. It's yeah. tasting awesome. We're very, very, very excited to launch this yeah. uh, during Beer Week. So we'll be pouring that as Brewer's Choice, and then it'll be at bars around New York City as well. So this is kind of our little... Ex- Pillow Talk Part 2, Cruzette Libations. That's right. I'd be remiss not to mention the final two events, one of them being uh, an event at Arrogant Swine. We're having a sausage fest with Josh Bernstein and Tyson Ho. Um, it's going to be half commercial, half uh, half homebrew kegs uh, at this at this party. Uh, tickets are 45 bucks. You can find more at Josh Bernstein, Joshua and Bernstein. Actually, they're $40 through the end of today. Aha. Uh-huh. So if you want to get in on this, do it today. Mary and last no. but not least... Last but not least is our closing bash for the New York City Beer Week. The closer is going to be a brunch at Brooklyn Bowl. And, uh, There's a lot of other great events. I would be remiss in not mentioning. I know that Rich from Bridge and Tunnel is hosting a great uh, sideshow kind of pizza action mm-hmm, event mm-hmm. on Wednesday of that week. So definitely check out New York City Beer Week web address. Uh, you could go to nycbg.com, New York City Brewers Guild.com as well. Yeah. So there's a lot a lot of the bars and breweries will be celebrating, so you know, get out there and get your drink on. And for all of you very far away, sorry for spending six minutes talking about local stuff. We hope you can visit us sometime. Please come. You can stay on Mary Knight's couch, right? Yeah. See? Awesome. What's happening today, Mary? Oh, today. So the, <laughs> all right, so Chris and I um, helped judge Homebrew Alley number nine. So that is New York City's homebrew premier one and only BJCP AHA certified homebrew <laughs> competition. It's the ninth year. We had 666 entries. That showed up. Yeah. We had a great time judging. Uh, lo and behold, the Sours category was swept by some of our favorite people. Yeah. Yeah. So you, if you've, if you've been fixed. listening all along, Blind. you heard them on episode number 29, Wood from the Hood. So they have returned. So we're missing one of you guys, but we have Oscar Norlander and Peter Salmon in the studio. Eric is in Rome, apparently, so he couldn't make it. But you guys took first, second, third in the Sour category. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> so, what are the toughest category? What are the toughest styles? Lo- you know, loose styles. I'm sorry. I did, you could keep talking. I was just pointing out. I want you to mention what they were. I know. One I'm, first, I'm getting there. Third. I'm getting okay. there. You're doing great, Mary. You're doing great. This was patting you on the back. That's all. I thought we got disqualified for a second, like via the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so that is category 17. It. It is the sour category encompasses a number of sour styles, but that is definitely one of the most challenging, difficult, and intimidating styles of beer to brew and brew well. So it's absolutely impressive. How many entries did you guys put into that category? Uh, we put seven into that category. Seven. So you took three, and then and there were there were thirty five entries in total. So that's important to know. Yeah. Yeah. So you. You didn't sweep it by being the only entrance. It's not a sweep no, by default. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, so you guys took first with your guza. You got took two with Passion of the Wood, which is a passion fruit lambic style. That's 17F for those of you who are BJCP ites. Um, and then number three was a Frambois lambic, 17F fruit lambic. Also, congratulations to Bill Carley, who got runner up. That means that the New York City Home Brewers Guild swept. All swept. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we rock here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's start with the Guza. So last time when you guys were on. Um, you, we most we talked a lot about barrels. Mm-hmm. So you have two barrels. One that you got that was a Zinfandel wine bar- barrel, thirty gallons, I believe. Yeah, yes. Right. So that you guys have been using, and then you had another barrel. Uh, yeah, we have a little barrel. Uh, it's a twelve gallon. It's currently inactive, but that's my fault. I'm sorry. But and that and most of these the Guzo came out of the thirty gallon barrel, correct? You guys had a right. lot of beers that came all, out. All of, that. of our lambic style beers come out of yeah, that. Uh, um, 
all three of these beers came out of the same barrel. Uh, there was some process that changed the beers after the barrel, but all three of them came out of the same barrel that won this year. Awesome. And so- like we talked about in the first on the first show, just to recap, uh, into this barrel, you make a very light beer being 50% Pilsner, 25% malted wheat, and 25% unmalted wheat? Pretty much. Uh, there, there's occasionally you know, some variances depending on what malts we have available. Sometimes, you know, we didn't grab everything that we wanted to, uh, right. but mm-hmm. yeah, pretty much Pilsner pale and then a uh, wheat. And at the time, you were a professional brewer. Uh, you were head brewer at at, uh, at at Greenpoint Beer Works, right? And, and things have changed, which we are talking about a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're still a professional brewer. I am still a professional brewer. Correct. Uh, yeah, I'm brewing at Brooklyn Brewery these days. Awesome. Um, so let's go I bring back to up. the recipe. Yeah, what? I only brought that up because uh, on the on the episode you were like, oh yeah, you know, being in a in a brewery all day, I have access to certain stuff, and you know, uh, you know, I'll be able to when you take five gallons worth of you know a small batch worth of, of grain, it's it's not a big deal, and so you have got a lot of grain easily easily in, in uh, around. Uh, there, it's always around. There's a, yeah, definitely a lot of uh, access to ingredients. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you guys are using so it's a ba- you know a very basic recipe that you're yeah. using for all of them. Yeah, one thing we are starting to change a little bit is uh, our mashing. We've always done, I mean, I know like turban mashes and other more complex stuff. Is so let's let's go back for be- people that are, you know, beginners or they're not familiar with sours. What is a turban mash? I'm trying to remember because I've know. never done one. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right, let's get that. Let's go. Keep going. But we've done just, you know, single infusion mashes. Right. Uh, we used to do them, you know, pretty much normal temp, like 156 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, 152, 156, somewhere in there. Yeah. Now we're starting to go even higher, up to as high as like 162, 164. I think the last one was almost 166. Wow. So you're getting a lot of residual sugar from that, correct? We're hoping right. to get more complex, like dextrins and other things that can't be broken down by the traditional yeast, uh, you know, to kind of give the bread more food to feast on for a long period of time. Uh, th- this last time that we brewed, um, so we used to all live together, and we don't anymore for the last uh, about year and a half. I think last time we were on the radio with you guys was right after we, you know, had broken mm-hmm. up the the band. And um, so since then, um, we've barely brewed together. We've done a, a couple of batches, and the, the last few were the the first ones that we really started talking about, you know, technique. What have we done? What could we do differently? Um, and how can we? make this beer better since we're making less of it let's make it better uh, so especially this last batch i think we really pushed the temperature and i really feel like that made a big difference uh we mm-hmm. you know once yeah 166 and uh by the time that it you know cooled down we did the the mash rest 166 and i think it only cooled down to about 158 after about an hour um then you know did run off typical the way that you normally would um you know usual boil and everything like that uh but the time that it normally takes to ferment it only fermented down from about um you know 1056 1060 i think we started at on this last one uh and it it was only down to about 1016 whereas normally we'd be down almost immediately down to about you know 1010 1008 Mm -hmm. um and that's with primary saccharomyces uh, or We've pretty much always gone the lambic uh, smack pack. Yeah, the, Lam- the lambic mm-hmm. blend smack pack from Y East, mm-hmm. um, and we've done a couple of vials from White Labs into the barrel uh, Lactobacillus pediococcus. Uh, but we usually just do all of our primary fermentation with the Y East smack pack lambic okay. blend. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So before you guys were doing this high uh, temperature, you were getting that's that's when you were getting down to like ten ten or yeah. something pretty quickly, right? yeah, even with the same blend. Yeah, okay, it, it was cool. a very fermentable wort. And, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm going to go back because I did have to look up turban mash <clears throat> just to be so I don't get it wrong on the radio. So basically, it's, I mean, it's similar. The goal is to break down larger proteins of the wheat and malt into free amino acids and produce a wart high in dextrins and starches. So you're basically removing some of the liquid portion of the mash, boiling it, and then reintroducing. So you guys are kind of doing a shortcut version of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Or related, but a much easier way. Yeah. That's a much easier way process. Trying to duplicate that by not doing that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Without all the mess. I know. Um, We're lazy. So then, you so you guys are doing traditional mash boil, or like, you know, this high temperature mash. Typical boil. You're hitting it with this, this mixed culture. 
Um, and then when does it go? Are you guys going into carboys? You're going straight into the barrel. Uh, we are putting it into carboys, and then often racked off into like you know corny kegs. Um, we you know at times we've given it you know eight nine months even, but oftentimes maybe two to four. In months. the carboy. Yeah, in right. carboy or off, often a or lot of that keg. in kegs. Yeah. Uh, you know after we get it kind of off the yeast. Um, but yeah, we, we like to give it some time to kind of develop before we introduce it, and also it's. It's often timing wise, like when do we want to pull stuff out? When do we want to make some batches? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with like the fruits and other things like that. So when you are guys are bracking it off a primary into a keg, then you're gonna let you can let that keg set, set there. What's the longest you think that you have let it sit in the keg? Uh, Success, but, you know, and then successfully introduced it to a barrel later. Probably no more than four months. Okay. Um, usually we'll brew stuff to be put into the barrel because the sooner we have beer ready for the barrel, the sooner we can mm-hmm. get stuff off the barrel so yeah. we can reintroduce it. So if we do a Solera system and because of that, you know, the faster we have something to put back in, the sooner we can get stuff out. Right. Um, and everything that we've made that's come out of the barrel, we still have to replace it. And right. so if you don't have anything to replace it with, then you know, yeah. you're just stuck looking at yeah. a really, really pretty barrel. But you guys are lo- so when you're putting stuff into the barrel, you're put it's you're not necessarily you don't have like a deadline of time. It's a range, you know. It could be some of it's younger and some of it's more. I think the earliest we've done is uh, about two months after okay. brew date, and I think the longest is probably about six months after okay. brew date. That's cool. That's mm-hmm. good to know. And that barrel has been full since you got it. Or when when you moved, you emptied it, and then it uh, was empty for like yeah, forty eight, seventy two hours, right. something like that. Uh, when we moved, uh, we put in some kegs move that over um one thing that's kind of important to note uh, where i think the character's starting to change is before it was like in a basement laundry room which i think kept the temperature more steady kept the temperature more in like the 60s yeah, and tile floors uh real consistent yeah but now it's it's in a fifth floor living room right. which you know i don't think is that ideal in the summer with kind of ac sometimes not other times and heat in the winter it's uh I feel like, uh, you know, I kind of wish I, I did have better temp control, but, you know, I don't have <laughs> space to put the barrel in the refrigerator or anything like that right. or something. And it's been pretty good this year, though. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back with more Sours on Foment About It. So, you like good beer. Whether you're a craft beer pro or just had your first sip of an IPA, GreatBrewers.com is your number one beer resource on the internet. GreatBrewers.com bridges the gap between the world's great brewers and the consumers who enjoy their products. With so much information and misinformation out there, GreatBrewers.com focuses on education and leaves no stone unturned. Take the Great Beer Test on their website and browse through an extensive product catalog. Download their mobile beer cloud app, which includes a GPS beer finder, a beer sommelier, and descriptions for over 5,000 different brews. What are you waiting for? Back up that passion for craft beer with some solid information and education. Visit GreatBrewers.com today. This is Brandon Hoy, co-owner of Roberta's, and you're listening to HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Welcome back to Foment About It on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. We're here in the studio with Peter Salmond and Oscar Norlander, uh, two of our favorite home brewers. They actually, along with uh, Oscar's brother Eric, swept category number 17 in the latest homebrew alley number seven or number 9 and also took best in show for yeah. their goose. We neglected to mention that. We have, a, uh, we have a question from the audience. The audience is actually in the, in the room. Where the, I say hi to Dave over there. Dave Sharstein. Hey, welcome to Ferment About It. Dave. Uh, Dave wants to know whether you guys agree with the order of, of, of the judges. Uh, which one was your favorite? So the first was the goose. Second was Passion of the Wood. Third was Frambois Lambic. Do you agree with the judges' decisions? Yes. Uh, but I will say this. We all were talking like a couple days before about predictions. Aha. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, so the night of the competition, Oscar, uh, was one of the judges. And um, so I what- should mention that I don't get to judge the categories I'm entered in. I only was judging other categories. Uh, correct. <laughs> all, all judges is done blindly. There's no names or anything. And you're not allowed to judge a category that you are entered in. Um, 
but when we found out that he was not able to judge the uh, the best in show, it became really really exciting for us. <laughs> um, it, just because that that meant we you know hopefully had a chance. You know, it, it could just mean they had enough judges, but it also could mean that we you know were in the running. Um, and, and so you know the brain starts going wild. You know, what could it be? What do you think it was? We entered ten beers. Which of these? What ten? is it? Yeah, um, and and so we started talking. Uh, this was before Eric had to fly to Rome because he he did come to Alewi for uh, the beginning of <laughs> yeah. it, and uh, he had to leave right at the beginning of the announcements of all the awards. Um, and so we're we're talking about all the different sours that it could be, since that was the category that we entered the most in. Um, and I actually thought it was going to be the frambois. I thought the the fruit was fantastic, very spot on. Uh, I thought the sour was delicious. The color was great. Um, and so that was my pick for number one, and that got number three. Yeah, uh, my brother did pick the passion fruit. He really liked that one a lot. And, I mean, it's a wonderful beer yeah. that we're drinking right now. Yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cheers. So, <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, speaking of passion, well, passion fruit, how did you get the passion? So last time I know you guys, last from the last show, used a lot of purees, right? Uh, still do. So yeah. talk about where did you get passion fruit puree? What form? Was it frozen, canned? Uh, yeah, I, I was uh, kind of talking with them a couple years ago even, and I'd mentioned kind of wanting to go. We've done a lot more like forest fruits, like blueberry, blackberry, raspberry, and they've been very good. But I kind of wanted to try something a little tropical, especially because the neighborhood we were living in was kind of a Caribbean neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went uh, to Chelsea Market there, the Italian place there, because I'd heard they had a lot of the frozen purees there. And they do. They have like you know twenty Juan, kind. Juan Italia. It's a it's a uh, Italian, an amazing Italian grocery store in Chelsea yeah. Market. Yeah, and yeah, they even got a few vegetable purees. But I don't know if I'm ready to try that. <laughs> but <laughs> split pea lambic. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, but I think I ended up like texting them like five different ideas or three or four. I can't remember what the others were off the top of my head. But like mango maybe or something like that. And. I was leaning passion fruit, and I, th- I think everybody kind of agreed with that. So I, I grabbed a, a kilo of passion fruit, uh, figuring passion fruit is pretty strong uh, compared to some of the other fruits. So, so a kilo would probably go a pretty long way with about – usually we're mixing about like four, four and a half gallons. Right. You know. Uh, uh, yeah, we do all of our, our fruit mixes in a corny keg. Uh, so this is post barrel, right? Mm-hmm. Post barrel, we don't ever put fruit into the barrel since we do a solera. We always want to keep the barrel kind of clean and mm-hmm. the same, so we can do something like the goose. Mm-hmm. Um, so when do you decide when liquid is is ready to be pulled out in the barrel? As soon as we have liquid to put in the barrel, <laughs> <laughs> we should be brewing more. Uh, we, we keep talking about oh, well, let's brew more, let's brew more, and um, yeah, I don't know, it's the long game. Part of it is also evaporation. You know, yeah. you're seeing the level kind of go down. You're like, well, we should be topping it off. So maybe we can pull some out, add some there. But you're uh, finding you're finding that most of the liquid that you that comes. Well, how, first of all, what do you think the average amount of time that the, the your beer is in the barrel? Uh, that's it could be a range. Uh, it's tough because there's some in there left yeah. over from everything. I mean, from when you the move it now, system. So. I mean, now the barrel's three and a half years old, approximately, uh, yeah, just yeah, over forty five months. Um, yeah, we first filled it July 2011, so... Yeah, uh, yeah, just over three and a half years, and uh, so yeah, there's some of it there. Uh, I but guess it's reliably coming out sour We're probably point, pulling... Right? I mean, you're getting kind of a reliable oh, yeah. liquid <laughs> yeah. at this point. Originally We're pulling intended. about a third a year, so I guess the average is still pretty old. Yeah. 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 Maybe half a year, I mean, yeah, so yeah, the average is probably several years old. Okay. Even, even after the move? Or was it was it empty when the move? So the new well, you move. put all, but we put all the stuff back in. Yeah. Ah, so you yeah. took it gotcha. out to move it and then put it back in when you gotcha. got. Yeah, to yeah, it wasn't all fresh beer at that point, right. and gotcha. that was yeah in like April of uh, 2013. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, fascinating. I have fun. to say, I mean, this is absolutely amazing. I mean, the passion fruit. I didn't get to judge sours. I was uh, they needed me in ciders. Yes, it's Saturday afternoon. But I did, I volunteered to steward the mini best of show at the sours table. And I will say that 11 sours were put forward. We had four different four different judging teams. Um, wow. And normally that's kind of high, but there were such, I mean, there were so many great sours yeah. entered in that category. With, with 35 entries, I mean, that that's kind of crazy for yeah. the sour 11 category. Yeah. And again, you know, it's, yeah, a very, it's a very difficult category to judge. Those are very difficult categories to brew. There's a wide range yeah. of of aromas and flavors and everything and styles yeah exactly yeah. yeah i mean so many like the lambic styles are are a bit similar but then you mm-hmm. got some like a berliner vice yep. in there which is very different style yeah. yeah um 
so I did get to taste a lot of these, but I mean, I, I'm so impressed. The aroma is just amazing. Passion fruit. I love passion fruit. Yeah. Um, and it really, not only is it an amazing, you you know, really captures the, the kind of esoteric essence of, of passion fruit, but it also is super complimentary to the sour profile as well. So it's, I think it's better than we even hoped for. Yes. It, we yeah. had high expectations and, uh, when we got the, the frozen puree, we, we opened it up and, you know, it's, it's a, you know, a plastic tub with a plastic lid and yeah. you peel it off and it just immediately just smelled so good. And you dip your finger in it and taste it. And it's amazing and tart and sweet yeah. and just yeah. very yeah. aromatic and fruity and just everything I've never had in a sour beer and everything I've ever wanted in a sour beer. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. So, you know, those of you who are out there that don't have access to some place like Buon Italia or Clucian's also, I think, carries the same similar purees. Uh, Clucian's in um, Lexington and 28th area in New York City. But definitely, I mean, there's a lot of international stores and international groceries all across America now. So regardless of what kind of international store you have in your area... Check it out, man. You never know what you can find. Yeah. Goya and Lafay make some great pasteurized uh, uh, purees. Yeah. yeah. You want the pasteurized, not not uh, pr- preservatives, right? Yeah, you're just you're talking about 100% frozen puree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I will say you can also order them, like, off of Amazon and stuff like yeah. that, but the shipping is, is really rough, where the mm-hmm. cost ends up being oftentimes three times as much as buying it locally. Yeah. Uh, but it's certainly an option, and there you will get the full range. Because even with 20 there, I think that brand, I can't remember the name, but they make like 40, I think. Different kinds of yeah. fruits, yeah. Yeah, they make like everything you can imagine. Um, I, I will say one thing when choosing kind of fruits for Lambics, I do find kind of the tartar fruits are a better balance. Some of the, the tartar berries, like raspberries, blackberries, um, you know, st- stuff like the passion fruit that has kind of a tart edge just plays with it so well. Mm-hmm. Because if you have another fruit, like maybe... A strawberry, I think, uh, would be tricky because with a strawberry, you you don't expect it to be tart. So when it's a tart beer with strawberries, it might not quite uh, taste the way you'd imagine mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I would agree with you. So let's talk about your your number one winner, the Guza. So t- tell me about its path to bottling. Um, so the same start to the path, uh, we, we had to empty the barrel. Mm-hmm. So we had brewed some beer to you know, get ready for the barrel. And, uh, so this is a blend of 40 month aged, um, Lambic. Oh, and frothy. Um, so 40 month Lambic blended with, uh, some about six month old non barrel aged sour that we'd brewed to refill the barrel. Uh, so this is, you know, as kind of traditional as we can get with the Lambic on our system in Brooklyn. Um, and it's just, you know, it's old and young blended together, but, uh, you know, basically 50-50 as far 50/50. as the uh, amount. And how'd you guys decide to do, so I feel like this actually, this bottle is actually, so I judged best of show, even though I didn't judge a sour category, I did judge best of show. Um, what was that table like, Mary? It this was year? <laughs> amazing. Honestly, so the first time I ever judged best of show was, I think, fall of 2006 at the Snurk competition in Connecticut. Um, and so... Of the nine years I've been judging best of show tables, that was honestly the most impressive best of show table I've ever. Usually, you know, there's a cu- there's like usually three or four beers. So best of show, how it works is it's the winner from every category. Mm-hmm. So these are number one first place beers. And usually, though, even though that's the case, they all won their category. Usually there's like three or four right away that you can say, hey, we don't, you know, these are not as good as the rest of them. Yeah. This time it was just simply not that case. So going back to the Guza, so it was a blend. How'd you guys decide to do fifty fifty? Um, a, a lot of that it, it's kind of guesswork um, because we usually have kegs of stuff that's getting ready to go into the barrel, and then we also are pulling stuff out of the barrel first to make room for the new stuff. Uh, so you're kind of looking at you know how much of which do you have. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not specifically a you know tasting and weighing it or anything like that. We don't put it on a scale and and, and weigh it out. Uh, it's mostly just, you know, how does it taste, and let, let's try to go 50-50. Uh, I think we've done a goose pretty much every year since we started doing the barrel. Yeah. Um, at, at least, you know, about a year after we, we started pulling stuff out of the barrel. Um, and one thing which we didn't do this year, which we'd done every year, was a straight lambic. Uh, we yeah. just kind of, I don't know, we didn't... I don't, I don't think we had as much as we had in years past, uh, just since we haven't been brewing as much. Yeah, and we often found that, although we liked the straight lambics, we felt like... The goods and the fruits were even better, so mm-hmm. we felt that uh, it was better to try uh, 
to make some more interesting creative stuff. Yeah, I really like this because you definitely get the kind of that tart, and also I always compare it to old Rieslings, that kind of petrol note that really good goozes and also some lambics have. So you kind of get that tart, uh, almost petrol intensity up front, and then in the middle is this really nice, soft kind of sweet tart sugar, like. Yeah, you know, like mm-hmm. not malty sweetness that's not overwhelming. It's still balanced. You know, the tartness sticks throughout, and then that that nice uh, sour, you know, petrol comes behind. So it's really has a lot of you know, it's a nice path in your mouth. I, I really like that you can still taste the the barrel. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can yeah. still taste the Zinfandel barrel that's mm-hmm. in here. Yeah, uh, but it, it's not as strong. You know, some of the the straight lambics that we've had have, have been a little bit more barrel forward, mm-hmm. uh, which are almost aggressively sort of a uh, whiny. Uh, and I think this is just a little bit softer, and I think we have you know really nice carbonation that's a- yeah. appropriate. And uh, I just think it, it turned out great. Now, you, did know? You, you guys said you did not bottle condition these, correct? No. So yeah. tell us how you pre- prepped your bottles for Homebrew Alley, because I think that's you know that's something a lot of people it, you know yeah. have a hard time yeah. with. Um, do I bottle condition? Do I you know? We did a little bit of bottle conditioning the first couple times we entered yeah. Homebrew Alley, and the last few years we've pretty much exclusively done force carbonated and uh, counter pressure filled. And so we okay. have a you know a single fill head counter pressure fill where you have the two dials and you're, yeah. you're doing one bottle at a time. Um, but I think that you have a little bit more consistency, yeah. and I think you have less of a chance of gushers, mm-hmm. which is terrible as a judge, as you guys know. Um, but it, it's just you know you get a little yeah. bit more of a clean beer. You have you know no sediment at the bottom. You know what you're getting uh, and, and i also feel like this type of thing i can keep it you know five days or maybe a couple of years and hopefully the carbonation will be similar right i'm a little afraid of with you know the brett and stuff in there if i put in some sugars over a while it's just going to get way too carbonated yeah. and especially with the funk yeah because yeah. that just, is the un- i mean that's still unpredictable even though you guys have you know a kind of a more predictable flavor profile that you're working with you're it's still unpredictable as far as fermenta- fermentation right right mm-hmm. especially you know when we're adding fruit there's still residual that's sugar true. that's in there uh we, and we try to you know give it a little bit of time to you know finish fermenting in the keg before we you know deal with it but y- you never know uh some of our you know year or two old stuff in bottle we force carbonate it but you know you still have the boat out caps and you know you worry about bottles exploding yeah yeah, yeah. uh but yeah i've been pretty happy with the uh, uh counter pressure filling and uh, just instead of doing a traditional bottle conditioning. So when uh, so you guys are continuing with the barrel and your sour program. Mm-hmm. Yep. Are there are you guys doing other styles? What's kind of the present and future of? Yeah, um, I mean we did do like uh, an American style. Yep, we, we had we got third. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I judged that. It was good. Yeah, that, it was that was great. our first uh, brew in a bag. Actually. Really? Yeah. Really? Right yeah, we were trying for an imperial stout and. Uh, didn't quite get there. Well, it fit right in there in that American <laughs> style category. That was delicious. It was great. Yeah. And we were already talking American style. I think before the brew date ended, we were already like, okay, maybe it's an American style. We have a, a lot of hops in there. And I remember the first time we tasted it, we were almost thinking like almost black IPA levels of hoppiness. But we're like, we got a couple months till the competition. Yeah, the think, hops are going to die down. And I think we brewed that in August. And we, we brewed it early because we were planning on doing Imperial Stout. Uh, but because it didn't reach the levels that it should have for mm-hmm. that uh, style, uh, we just kind of upped the hops a little bit and gave the hops time to mellow, mm-hmm. um, and I think it really actually balanced out pretty well. It did. It was great. Yeah. That's cool. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask you. Going back um, to the beginning of our conversation, when you guys do a high-temperature mash at 166, mm-hmm. is your are you still getting the same um, extraction, or did you have you had to adjust? Uh, th- this last time we didn't have any any problems with extraction. Yeah. It's actually a uh, higher gravity than we were shooting for. Okay. Um, huh. Yeah, we but, haven't done enough times to really have any good date on that. One thing that's so great about a barrel program like this is you've such a big range on gravity. It's like if one time you get ten forty, one time you get ten sixty five. We're just shooting for about maybe a ten fifty four average. Yeah. Then yeah, just the there. next time you adjust the other direction, right. Right. so you can kind of. I mean, when you're blending into the barrel, even an, a 1070 in there isn't going to raise the barrel all that much if you had, you know, seven gallons of that. Right, right, right. Cool. So last time we spoke, you guys were doing it. You were at 155 as your mash temperature. Just, hey, you remember then? Those are good good old days. Also, to to the other thing you were asking, one of the things that I really loved about our first episode, too, was she asked what the future was for for your brewing. And, you know, you both looked confused like you weren't really trying to do anything other than sours. And you spoke to that, the last one being like, you know, you can being in New York, we're very fortunate by having access to all these different Mm -hmm. great beers. You can go to the bodega and you can get those. And it's very rare to make or to to get sours at an affordable price. And uh, it's hard to make a really good 
sour and you guys are making lots of it and yeah. god damn it i want to live with you <coughs> sorry part, Mary. part of it also is uh <laughs> i mean you can clean and sanitize all your equipment and stuff like that but it's very easy to get cross-contamination between your sour beers and your non-sour beers and if we're making mostly sours it, you know it's just not that much of a problem yeah. we really haven't if we wanted to do a lot more regular, you know, non-sour beers, I would think at some point we'd start labeling our tubing, labeling all our kegs, and going, this is our sour half, this is our non-sour half. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, I think we still have a couple of kegs that are marked no sour. Um, that, that I think those are dying out fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Awesome. Well, that was our show on Foment About It. Thank yeah. you, Peter Salmon. Thank you, Eric Norlander. I keep, going, Norlander. <laughs> I keep going back and forth. He's here in spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Norlander, Oscar Norlander, uh, Dave Sharstein, uh, Jaren David, Mary Isaac. Thanks to our Liz engineer, Smith. Liz Smith. Yeah. Look at that. She's not even waving. No. Like, oh, there she goes. All right. Aww. You can say wave against the air, airwaves. Um, check out NewYorkCityBrewersGuild.com to find out what's happening for uh, New York City Beer Week. Come to Brunity. Uh, if you're in New York, try our beer. And thank you for listening. We'll be back next Monday at 7 p.m. with For Men About It. For Men About It. For Men About It. it. (laughs) The theme song for For Men About It has been provided by Chris Kuzmi. listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can email us with questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. 